Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. Now then, come on there. Them stew with salt, them stew without. Come on now. This is episode 147, recorded March 14th, 2023. Gruesome Magazine. I am your host, Jeff Moore, or as we sometimes known as WB0487 Moore J. Um, <laughs> on this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monsters, spirits, psychos, and villains that have haunted movie going audiences since the dawn of film history. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, we've been partnering with Play Now Media, and we got we got podcast episodes up on their streaming apps. So, Classic Era is on uh, Sci Fi Classic, uh, Classic Sci Fi Movie Channel, Classic Horror Movie Channel, Wicked Horror TV Channel, and the Free Classic uh, Movie Channel, a Free Classic Horror Movie Channel, and the Free Horror Movie Channel. Uh, 70s and 80s are also up. They're both on the Wicked TV, Wicked Horror TV, Wicked TV. Search Wicked, you'll find it. Um, <laughs> the uh, And the uh, free horror movies. And I believe retro horror, which is 70s, 80s, and 90s. However, that is currently just on Roku, I believe. The other ones you should be able to find for Amazon, etc., all right, and check those out. There's a lot of good movies there. And in fact, we watched today's selection on the classic sci-fi movie channel. All right. With me this week are my incredible co-ghosts. Uh, Chad Hunt is not able to be here, but I am joined by the uh, decades of horror classic era women whose names end in... <laughs> <laughs> that's right they do <laughs> oh i just like to have fun you know got to slip a python in there wherever yeah i should have looked it that's great <laughs> <laughs> sorry no all right no sorry. Um, no sorry. <laughs> no. all right first up <laughs> is uh whitney Goyazzo, an accomplished artist makeup artist and writer whitney how you doing I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Winding down our California experience here in the last few days. So, yeah, it'd be nice. good to be back home. Mm. Well, they had a blizzard this weekend. It's March. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, also with us is Daphne, who's awesome, stupendous, and likable as hell. Daphne, how you doing? I'm doing really good. Good. I'm sorry Chad's not here, but as I always, am too. it's great to see you guys. I'm bummed because <laughs> I would really like to hear uh, what he thinks of this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is probably the, the time where it's the least important to say this is a spoiler podcast because this is a <laughs> movie that's been remade a ton of times and from a book that almost everybody has to read in school, I think. <laughs> so... Anyway, our movie this episode is 1984. Now, this is the 1954 BBC TV live production uh, directed by Rudolph Cartier, uh, obviously written by George Orwell, the novel, and then Nigel Neal adapted it as a television play. And the cast includes Peter Cushing, Yvonne Mitchell, Andre Morel and Donald Pleasance. Production company is BBC TV Live Productions. It was filmed at, uh, there was a few uh, outdoor shots that were done before the live broadcast at Studio B, Alexandra Palace, and at a demolition site that later became BBC Television Center, and Studio D at BBC's Lime Grove Studios. Uh, the filming dates were November 10th and November 28th for those uh, splice-in outdoor shots. And uh, it was finally released. You know, it was first shown on December 12th. 
but it wasn't filmed until a reshowing on December 16th. Um, so the release date was on BBC Sunday Night Theater, uh, season five, episode 50, and was shown, uh, was, was uh, done live on December 12th, 1954. And then it was done uh, and not recorded. And then it was done live again on December 16th, 1954. And this time it was filmed as a uh, 35 millimeter film, what they called telerecording. I believe that's uh, rotoscoping. I think it was the uh, version of that at the time. Uh, the synopsis of the storyline is, um, uh-oh, that is not the synopsis. How could I have done that? That is the synopsis for Fantastic Voyage. So, in a society that has eliminated many imbalances, surplus goods, and even class struggle, there are bound to be deviates. Winston Smith is one of those. He starts, due to his inability to double-think, with thought crime. This is in a society that believes the thought is as real as the deed. Eventually, he graduates through a series of misdemeanors to elicit sex and even plans to overthrow the very government that took him in as an orphan. My apologies for the edit there. Don't know what I was thinking, but I love this. Uh, this is like a pyramid in the, mm -hmm. in the film of the slogans. That actually sound kind of familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Fit right in today. Ministry of Truth. Ignorance is strength. Freedom is slavery. War is peace. Uh, and the Ministry of Truth is not all that truthful, right? The Ministry right. of Love. Um, <laughs> yes. Let's... Uh, Go to first impressions here, then. And uh, since this was Daphne's pick, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, yes, it was my pick. I had never seen it before, um, but I had heard about it. And uh, um, I mean, um, I, I'm totally, I don't know what's wrong with my brain, you guys. Sorry. <laughs> Peter Cushing. Hello. Um, Peter Cushing in this movie, uh, the thought of him, it just, it was sounded great. So that's why I wanted to see it. And um, it's been a long time since I read the book and I thought, you know, I'm going to try. And I, um, I really liked it. Um, it feels kind of funny saying liked because of the subject matter, but I, I did really like it. And um it's made, it's kind of stuck in my head. It's brought that story back in my head and kind of make me think about things um, a lot when I'm just sitting around kind of letting my mind wander. Um, I think it's, I don't know. We'll talk about it. Sorry to be a little vague. It's just pretty heavy stuff. <laughs> and, yes. and um, Peter Cushing did a, I th thought he did a great job. I, I, it wasn't the best. Um, I, it wasn't the best copy to watch, but in some ways, it kind of. I don't know. I didn't find it distracting, but I almost felt like it kind of added to it a little bit. Um, I don't know, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with you guys about it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I am too. I'm glad you picked it, uh, Whitney. How about you? Had you seen this before? No, I've never seen it, and I haven't read the book. Um, it wasn't something like in school that mm. I was approached with that I had to read, but no. Mm. Um, so yeah, this, this is a uh, pretty hard stuff to sit through and maybe, maybe for some of the same reasons that Daphne feels that <laughs> I don't because <sighs> horror is subjective, but society has horrors of their own and i think this really has a lot of stuff to play with on that mm -hmm. um yeah that's that's just how i'm feeling about this one right now so, yeah um thank you uh i had seen this a couple years ago after we got hooked up with play now media because it was on there classic sci-fi movie channel and i'd always heard about it and never seen it so i watched it and you're right i think 
I think most of what we're seeing is what's been on DVDs in the past, but, but there is good news, uh, which we'll, we'll see when I do like the posters and covers. Uh, uh, British Film Institute or BFI put out a Blu-ray a mm -hmm. little like about a year and a half ago or a little over a year ago. Uh, so I have it on order, but it takes a while. <laughs> Yay! To get, to get here, it's a, it's a British, and you have to have you have to be able to play it. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I read this book too, but I don't remember a whole lot about it except for the stuff that has become, you know, iconic uh, statements and slogans that are in society. You know, the idea of Big Brother is watching. Um, in fact, there's the TV show <laughs> Big Brother, <laughs> and then. Uh, you know, these ideas of uh, double or a uh, new speak and double think and thought police it, it just become so part of the, uh, I don't know, lexicon, I guess. Uh, Big Brother is watching is something you could hear just about anybody say uh, anywhere. So anyway, uh, wow. I just, I absolutely love Peter Cushing's performance is amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And that's what really hit me the first time through. This time through, I'm, I was hit a little bit more with the fact that they're shooting this live. And some of the work that they did on it, you know, the lighting and stuff like that was pretty cool. You know, if they're, if they're just running this like a play and um, they had to be on top of their game, I guess. Uh, and it is disturbing. It's very disturbing. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into... I'm not going to go too far into today's politics, but it certainly resonates with a lot of stuff that's been going on for like the last, uh, I don't know, six or seven years. Um, longer than that, actually, but even even more so. So, uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> let's let's get exactly down. i'm glad that i'm not the only one going uh <laughs> yes, it's, it's, what's that that's i'm kind of i'm glad i'm i'm not the only one that's kind of it's hard to t it's it's very it makes you think and so i feel like to put that into words is something that you know you could be really flippant about it if you wanted to and say things but i feel like it makes you think and you have to kind of digest it a little bit if you want to look at it honestly and talk about the stuff that it at least that's what i think it um if you and talk about some of the stuff that it turns it turns mm -hmm. up you know um so it, that just makes me feel a bit better about being kind of flummoxed and putting my foot in my mouth at the beginning because it was just it's just so much <laughs> yeah i'm not sure how we're gonna do but I'll, i mean uh, We'll just throw it right out there. The, yeah, uh, let's talk about it. Winston Smith's job is to take Big Brother's proclamations from, you know, f from prior proclamations he's made that didn't turn out right and to go back and rewrite that news mm -hmm. so that it, and, and his boss literally tells him, well, that's, that's not, that's not what happened. So that can no longer exist. Mm -hmm. that report you know like yeah. there were obviously going to be attacked from northern africa but oh no it comes from the attack is in southern india so we have to go back and change big brother's prediction so, so that, that it was correct. accurate yeah, yeah. um right. so anyway to make it a historical record and therefore reality the the past for there yes. yeah yeah <laughs> um well let's let's look at some of these covers quickly there's not you know there's nothing really fancy in the artwork i don't really know what this is from mm -hmm. this was a one of the versions i found mm -hmm. um i like this, that some of the stuff in that in that one there i mean it's from like pictures from the show and right. i remember that the one with the bomb going off i really um i really liked that one that really struck a chord with me because it reminded me of um I know this was in the 50s, but it reminded me of, of, of stuff later, like in the 70s and 80s, talking about um, the nuclear war when I was younger. And it really that was something that really scared me. And so it was interesting it, that just kind of really pushed pushed those buttons for me. And, um, you know, it's black and white TV, not the not the best, but it it really got the point across visually. Yeah, yeah it, it did. It mm -hmm. did. Um, um, 
Not much there. That's actually mm-hmm. the uh, the, the uh, thumbnail for the movie in the uh, classic science fiction movie mm-hmm. channel. It's it's nice. It looks good. And this, I believe, was a, a DVD, maybe a videotape. I don't really know, but it's BFI. And this was definitely a DVD. <clears throat> and finally, this is the a new Blu-ray cover. Oh, that's sharp. Which adds yeah. some, adds some <laughs> color. And I did find a source for images, and it's I, I have no doubt it it was uh, I don't know if anybody else uses DVD Beaver. It's it's a mm-hmm. place that reviews DVDs and Blu-rays, mm-hmm. and whichever ones they review, they'll have like usually around half a dozen to a dozen uh, screenshots to show the quality of the images. Oh, okay. and they're really highly variable, even on the Blu-ray. You know, hmm. there'll be everything from one that looked just like what we saw to something that looks perfectly sharp and clear. So uh, for whatever reason, some of it, I guess mm-hmm. they're able to clear up some not. I'll be uh, interested to see, uh, to hear what you have to say when you get it. When yeah, you yeah, it. I'm, I'm fired up about that. Uh, so, yeah, we see these signs everywhere, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Big yes. Brother is watching you. And it, you know, it kind of seems like the U.S. is really paranoid about that. Um, <laughs> I think in England they have a lot more uh, CCTV um, mm-hmm. out and about in public. They could pick things up. In the U.S., it's usually just uh, uh, businesses that, for whatever reason, you know, Walmart will have surveillance in their parking lots and in their store and convenience stores, et cetera. Um, but if, as soon as you start doing it public we, in Iowa, they started putting up cameras in Des Moines on the freeway and they were with uh, radar and cameras and then, you know, taking a picture of the car that where they could see the license plate number and sending them speeding tickets. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Wow. That was like an incredible invasion of privacy is what. Hmm. Everybody yeah. said, and it finally got shut down you know, went through the legislature, and they had to quit using them. Really? So they don't use speeding cameras at all? Uh, well, the, the cops do, uh-huh. as long as there's a person doing it. But it's like something where there's like a camera up on a, right. on a tower or something shooting mm-hmm. it. No, no. Oh, yeah. We have them all over Seattle. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> there was a lot less, uh, you know, I think. My personal opinion, it was it was a good money maker, and it did mm-hmm. bring the speed limit down. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. and and made things a little less crazy. But mm-hmm. oh well, it's just always like, interesting for me to hear about how things are different around the the country. You know, yeah, uh, a legislator in Des Moines, I think maybe his son was driving his car and got a speeding mm. ticket, and it went on his record because he was the owner of the car and. That was where it all started. And uh, mm-hmm. apparently you could appeal them. And like uh, 75% of the time that you appealed, they just drop it. Mm-hmm. You know? So hmm. interesting. I don't, I, I don't know the details on it. Just that mm-hmm. I thought it was a little weird that people got that worked up about it. Wouldn't you want to? I'd like it to be safer on the highway. I don't know. Anyway. See, we're already, start, already talking about it. it it's... Yeah. <laughs> well, and in China, you know, uh, if you've mm-hmm. ever seen the shows in China, but they're watching classrooms like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, here they are. Mm-hmm. They're walking in the bottom. It's a little hard mm-hmm. to see, but. Um, and then I, I just threw these up to more signs. There's yeah. signs like everywhere. Yeah. Be ready to produce your papers. Uh, you're now entering the parole section. Mm hmm. Um, and it would just be so weird walking around with your name and number all the time. Um, yeah. yeah. On the on the front and back of his coat, right? Yeah. That's... Yeah. I mean, that, that just really gets it gets it home, gets the point across of um, so many things. <laughs> it does. Uh, and this was the opening thing above the panel where somebody opened the panel up and pushed mm-hmm. the buttons, and the, we got the three nuclear explosions. But 
Um, this rule is, uh, what, what does it say? Infringement of this rule is punishable by death. And that there's little things I, I like, like death yeah. is capitalized. Capitalized. <laughs> at the end of the cell. I didn't notice that, but you're right. That's good. <laughs> Section 22 slash B slash YB. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so let's see. Our two, our two main people are uh, Peter Cushing and Yvonne Mitchell. Peter Cushing, of course, is Winston Smith, and uh, Yvonne Mitchell is Julia Dixon, I think. And they happen to work. They're in the same cantina, I guess, for lunch. She, <laughs> she actually works with the uh, automatic pornographic novel writing machine mm -hmm. in that in the porno sec. Porno which sec. I found yep. extremely interesting. <laughs> Um, they had to keep the, as they would call them, they had to keep the proles happy, you know, so mm -hmm. ah, that was crazy. Um, I was really excited to see Peter Cushing as part of the reason, like I said, why I picked this. I um, really like Peter Cushing, obviously most of us do. And, um, but to see him um, in, in, in not necessarily like a hammer film or a straight up horror film, but something that's um, just so really intense like this. And he's just to kind of see him acting a little bit in a different role. And I really think he was phenomenal and I mm -hmm. was just sucked in to his character and the story and his acting. And um, I think he did a, f a fantastic job just looking at him now. It's yeah, he did so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more just because, mm -hmm. I mean, we're so used to seeing and knowing him for Rules for Hammer and then mm -hmm. seeing do something that was more, like I said, with a societal thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it was definitely more intense. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, my impression on this was uh, that this was kind of his... Uh, sort of reputation making mm -hmm. role that it was so uh, it was it, it was talked about so much I think the royal family talked about watching it and that's why they played it again a few days later and then mm -hmm. taped it um, yeah, I think I read that too so this is actually the second so does that mean this is actually the second performance but the first one live uh, first one taped uh, the first one was not taped Right. So the first one was live. So this is the first one taped. Taped, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was taped live, except mm -hmm. they had those few scenes, I think, that were shot outdoors that were done previously and then inserted mm -hmm. in okay. the broadcast. Um, Second yeah, performance, and, first one taped. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Donald Pleasance. Did not know he was in this. So shocked yeah. when I saw it. <laughs> Pleasantly shocked. Especially after just what we just watched a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there they are at, uh, waiting in line for the stew with salt and stew with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, and what's his job? Um, Newspeak. He helps write Newspeak, right? Yeah. The dictionary. He's, he's writing the 10th revision of mm -hmm. the Newspeak dictionary, I guess. And he talks about um, taking words out of language and um, um, in the, in the beauty of having less words that are, as I bumble over words, <laughs> to just take away words so that eventually it's hard to really communicate because mm -hmm. there's only one word that exists with no, no, no uh, distinctions around them or no right layers or yeah right what does he say we're not only inventing words we're destroying it's them destroying words yeah capital and i remember him talking about uh there's no more extraordinary no more superlative no no more wonderful it's mm -hmm. just all good good plus or good plus pl good double plus i guess yeah mm -hmm. and then no more bad or terrible it's ungood mm -hmm. <laughs> uh yeah and he was really proud of that. Yeah. And I thought his, the dialogue, 
just really pointed out how um, just the thought control and the the level of thought and um, just the way that everything is just kind of being brought down and destroyed slowly and slowly. But there, there's like this bigger plan that they're moving towards where they're eventually going to destroy, every, you know, totally control the past and thought and what words mean. And that's such a big concept. And then just when he talks about the dictionary, I feel like I just really get that point across. And the more you think about what that would mean if language was like that, and that when you try and communicate with somebody, if there's, if, if, you, if you don't need to say bad anymore, because um, what was the new speak for bad? Ungood. 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 Yeah. So if you don't have bad anymore, it's just ungood. Essentially, like bad doesn't exist. Or it, good it is just so right. complicated and they did such a good job of ex of explaining really what that means if you take away language and how with that word with with language you can't communicate or have ideas right or thinking and that's to get it into such a succinct um obviously I'm an excellent example of how hard it is because I'm doing a terrible <laughs> job of, of say, doing it succinctly, but words his character <laughs> and yeah, words very hard. Um, um, his character and the dialogue in that, I just, it was unsettling and disturbing yeah. and very clear. <laughs> and I thought it was great. You know. And I have to get personal for this for a second. And mm -hmm. I'm, I don't, I'm not going to apologize for this because like hearing that was so chilling considering mm -hmm. something I'm doing right now, like is like going in, like some would say connecting cultures, reconnecting roots. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Not what language, like it made me think, you know, a lot of people like have lost cultures and languages and like, and now this is talking about that and hearing that in the story is like, man, how many times have I cried because I think about the language that I'm picking up on that not many, mm -hmm. you know, know or realize that a lot of people have been severed from those cultural languages and ties. Mm -hmm. but and their whole stories, right? Their whole stories and histories of people. So, yeah. Anyway, I know it's a little off. But in a oh. way, not so much, because it's just, it's eerie. You know, it's really eerie, like the subject matter. So. Mm -hmm. It feels like, even though the, so the book 1984 was published in 1949, and I haven't looked this up, so I could be wrong, but I always heard that he wrote it in 48, and the reason it's 1984 was he just swapped those numbers, mm -hmm. 48 to 84. But um, I don't know why you would, otherwise arbitrarily pick mm -hmm. a time 36 years in the future as mm -hmm. yeah. having all this happen. But anyway, um, so where are we now? Well, let's see, 50, we're over 70 years later, and it feels even more appropriate now. Mm -hmm. It feels like there's whole sections striving for this, mm -hmm. you know, whole, whole portions of society. Mm -hmm. um, one of the comments you said about that dialogue there, one of the things that Donald Pleasant says to, or, or that uh, Syme, I think is his name. Is it Syme? Yeah, uh -huh. Syme. Uh, what he says to Winston Smith is, the whole point of Newspeak is to narrow thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, oh boy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I wanted to point out real quickly too mm -hmm. that this is an example of, I'm pretty sure both of these were taken from the Blu-ray. So you can see the difference in the oh, quality uh -huh. of the images. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's just an example. Um, you know, Whitney, you said, you kind of said, oh, it's kind of off, or, but it's, it's not because no, it's um, not. it is, um, it's so not, it's not not, or however you would say it in Newspeak, because it does cover pretty much everything. I mean, yeah. it, um, and it just, 
it yeah I'm, there i am speechless again <laughs> personal but i know i'm like mm, this isn't like but i guess in some ways for a lot of people like because of you know whatever their family histories mm -hmm. have experienced or like ancestral or whatever you know there's there's something that hits a nerve with mm -hmm. this for me in that in, in that section of like talking mm -hmm. about changing words and and language and i'm like mm. it was it's it's like we speak dominantly english and and spanish and a lot of people have lost cultures and languages when i think about things like this and it's mm -hmm. and it got when i started to think about that mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things in politics that are named, you know, so, so mm -hmm. calling things pro-life mm -hmm. or the Patriot Act, that's not an accident. Mm -hmm. That's to make it hard for you to say, I'm not pro-life or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm against the Patriot right. Act. How can you be against the Patriot right. Act? You know, uh, mm -hmm. they, they name it things like that to, to make it, uh, tough to, um, to go against anyway. Um, yeah. So what happens is, uh, good old, uh, Julia is, she works in this section where they have this automatic writing machine that writes pornographic novels. And, uh, I think she fakes an accident or causes mm -hmm. an accident or something and leaves a note puts a note in uh, Winston Smith's hand that says, I love you. Just a little strip mm -hmm. of paper. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been thinking she's been after him. You know, you're always looking over your shoulder. Who's spying on you? Who's looking mm -hmm. for something to report you on? Because if you report somebody, then you can, you can get ahead. Right. It's, it's a lot like there's a whole lot of stuff in here that reminded me of Nazi Germany and the Hitler mm -hmm. youth and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. the neighbors watching the Jews and reporting to the, whatever. So, um, yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure that had a lot to do with, uh, what he was doing, but, uh, or, or the, the genesis of the novel, but to, to take it even farther. Well, um, and up to, and in before, um, Julia gave him that note, you see that he has already been kind of struggling himself with, uh, thoughts of questioning big brother and oh, yeah. that he's he's been breaking some rules on his own just by writing and and um, having thoughts and and going and kind of exploring things in the proletariat area or the prole and um, so you see him kind of like you know also having his own questions about what's going on, which I thought was really interesting about. Uh, cause you see him like that. And then he's, he thinks that Julia, he's suspicious of Julia before she says that she loves him or passes right. a note and he's right. planning on killing her. And he's like totally in, he's like, I'm going to crush her skull. I'm going to, I got to kill her, you know? And so it's, he is a much more complicated, um, character or what's going on with him in some ways it, it is kind of it seems like a little superficial some some a little bit at first but I feel like he later on as the movie goes on you really see how they the chemistry changed. yeah and That's also but also like the you know you use the word bipolar earlier you know about the weather but it's kind of like their love for each other but the situation so horrible that you would betray someone that you love. Yeah. You would kill someone. Be, even you would you would never. You know you would, even though you would think you never would. You would like right. to believe that you never would. You know you would, and so to see him just kind of bounce back and forth between those thoughts, I thought they did a really good job of talking about how complicated and how much of a mind fuck this mm -hmm. stuff is because you um that's what's really going on that's what's really so horrible that's really what's so personal about this is 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 that kind of stuff and so i kind of like that peter cushing the character was he, he could appear weak he could appear strong he could um you know he could kill someone he could sleep with someone the next you know it was just he was he was all over the place but he he really wanted but there was this thing that really 
he really wanted to get big brother. He really wanted to fight against big brother. That that's what he wanted to do. But anyway, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a hard watch. Um, so I'm trying to think of what to show here. Well, as an example of the things that they were doing, here's his, his neighbor Parsons, who seems like he's not a very, doesn't seem like a very deep thinker. He just <laughs> wants to do right. He seems to be pretty happy and, and uh, goes to all the party events and everything. And um, mm -hmm. that's where he talks to him in the thing. You have one of those telescreens behind him. Mm -hmm. the uh where the big brother speaks to you uh but in the shop below uh parsons isn't home but there's a sink clog and the, those kids are like little monsters yeah. but they're allowed to be little monsters because mm -hmm. the parents are scared to death that they'll you know report anything any minor thing to the mm -hmm. party and something will happen to them so uh, and yep. in the end, that's what happens to Parsons, right? Mm -hmm. Apparently he has a dream and says, I hate big brother in his sleep. And his daughter turns him in and mm -hmm. <laughs> there he is. So mm -hmm. that, those kids are just, oh, Lord. Mm -hmm. It just goes to show like, and like certain things are taught, you know, mm -hmm. but how children see things and how they're raised and I'm like oh gosh mm -hmm. you know they, they definitely portrayed this in that story and like what was it the the girl um when she was asked about like seeing some foreigner and she said oh I, I had to say something because they wore different shoes or something and right like, what right. oh this well even even in the scene with the sink <laughs> she's yeah she, she's every single act is a suspicion of something mm -hmm. so you know sabotage how, yeah. yes how mm -hmm. did yeah their sink is clogged and it's some sort of sabotage to make her late for mm -hmm. her party meeting or something but mm -hmm. and then and then uh, when when uh, winston unclogs the sink it was like oh well you did it anyway how do you yeah. know so much about sinks yeah. you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Mm -hmm. uh anyway um, so trying to think here, I don't really have anything that shows him, you know, you can tell he's, uh, Winston Smith is in, is not at ease, right? He's, he's got a level mm -hmm. of unease with what's going on. Uh, so he's got a, a diary that he hides, uh, and writes, the, the about all he's written on it that we've that we see is I hate Big Brother, I think. Mm -hmm. Or Big yeah, Brother. Yeah, or down with Big Brother or, or down death with to death. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um but you can tell he hides it and he's scared to death that mm -hmm. anybody would see it. And then he goes wandering through the parole district, which is I sort of got the idea that that wasn't normal because when he walks in the bar that's mm -hmm. labeled bar. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I have that. And I don't want to show that yet because it's there's some stuff at the end. Anyway, um, everybody looks at him because mm -hmm. the, the proles don't have to wear their names and stuff on coats. And mm -hmm. they have no, I, I, I don't quite, I don't know. It isn't like he lives in like a uh, luxury apartment <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the the show didn't really um, uh, go into detail or really explain. I felt very good the um, the difference between the party members and the proles. So you just kind of got an idea of that these were two separate groups. Um, so I, so like when when they were talking about how um, the party makes. Um, pornography or drinks or whatever and they try and they make them specifically for the proles to kind of make them feel like they're doing something wrong they're getting away with something it was kind of like I, it would have been nice to know a little bit more about um the two groups and kind of why they're they're separated and like i said it's been a long time since i've, I've read the book so i don't i, well, I don't know but... they, they even 
they even make mention of uh, having uh, machines write songs. That, mm-hmm. Oh, this woman's singing this song that she think was passed down through her family and mm-hmm. with no idea that it was written by a machine mm-hmm. in order to get this you know, out of them, whatever it was. Well, the proles, you know, as I think about it, were the, they were the working class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Basically. So, mm-hmm. um, and I think somewhere it said that the only thing that runs efficiently is, is new speak and the thought police and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm just going to start going down these. So, um, yeah. So in the meantime, he's going out, he finds this little shop, he buys a snow globe, uh, from this guy that seems like a kindly old proprietor and and uh, kind of strikes up, I don't know, not so much a friendship, but an acquaintance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they, uh, when, after he and uh, Julia meet and start their affair, I guess, they rent a room from this guy that's supposed to not have a telescreen in it. Mm-hmm. So supposedly it's not being monitored. Um but yeah, so, and, it, you know, it doesn't take hardly anything for them to like totally dive into it. But no. when you've yeah. lived your entire life without any affection mm-hmm. or touch. Right. Uh, and I like how they handled it too. Cause part of me is like, well, you're terrified that you're going to get caught, but it's like, they're probably so ter- They're so terrified. They know that they're eventually going to get caught. Right. They know, everybody knows that at some point they're going to, be wrongly accused or killed or caught or whatever. So I can understand where at that, that point you're like, I'm just going to trust you or I want to tell myself that I trust you and I'm just going to do it, you know? And so they all, you just instantly just love each other and um, sleep with each other and share, you know, everything, all your secrets because you, who else you're going to talk to? And I thought that was really interesting too. I mean, that's such a, such an intense and powerful um, concept and, and thing to talk about that the, this desperation where you kind of tell yourself certain things or you allow yourself to take risks because you already know you're a dead person. Yeah. You know, it's, um, yeah. And yeah. I kind of felt like that bottom picture is sort of showing that she has kind of a, they, they don't, they're comforting each other, but they don't mm-hmm. either one of them look at peace or, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, like I said, I, I was a little, I was a little confused because I, I didn't see him, you know, at first uh, having feelings for her or mm-hmm. you know, happening, but it did. And then to, and today with what's going on with them, yeah, though the feelings could be genuine, but also when you're put in a situation like that they are in, people would call it trauma bonding. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Ooh. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So Donald Pleasant, when he sits and has uh, lunch with him, he seems like he's all, you know, gung ho party, right? Mm-hmm. He's so excited mm-hmm. about writing this new dictionary mm-hmm. and everything. And then uh, Winston Smith runs into him, Syme, at this weird bar called the Chestnut Tree. And the only other people in the bar are like three old guys that were caught apparently and have been, I don't know what else to call it other than reconditioned. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But then that's when uh, we get a, we get sort of a, a Donald Pleasant's moment when all of a sudden he freaks out (laughs) because they fired him and he doesn't know what he did. What did I say? Did you tell, did you tell him, you know, he gets, he gets Mm -hmm. that frantic, Mm-hmm. Donald Pleasance mode going, and mm-hmm. uh, um, it's freaky because, from our point of view, how could this guy have done anything wrong? You know, mm-hmm. yeah, right. He's he's writing the dictionary exactly. So then, in the meantime, uh, he says he's got this the tenth revision of the New Speak dictionary, and and but it isn't out yet; only advanced mm-hmm. copies, and. Uh, I don't remember why, but he's Pierre Cushing. Winston Smith is talking to his boss, O'Brien, who's played by Andre Morel. Well, he he thinks that he's made a con. After he meets Julia, he kind of starts thinking that 
he makes a connection with O'Brien. Like maybe O'Brien is um, part of the brotherhood or kind of is against big brother. Um, and so he wants to go and talk to him because he had a conversation with him where he invited him to come to his office. Mm -hmm. and so I think Cushing thinks that there's like, um, he's thinks the same way that he and Julia do. Yeah, and I, I think just the fact that he met Julia leads him to mm -hmm. believe there must be yeah, other people. others like know? that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think he's hoping that there are other people, so he he is kind of interpreting things, you know, looking for things. And he, he supposedly gives him a copy of that 10th edition of the dictionary, but that's not what it is. It's supposedly a book written by their the, <laughs> the rebel leader. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway. But of course, things are not as they seem, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they end up getting caught up in the apartment. Well, let's see, where did I have this? Oh, I want to throw this one in too. So yeah. that's her, uh, Julia, at her uh, pornographic novel writing machine. <laughs> <laughs> And then in the bottom is one where she apparently got hold of some other clothes and some makeup. Uh, mm -hmm. So when they go to their new hideaway, she dresses up um, mm -hmm. and, and is excited about that. Feels feels good. And um, so that, that was kind of a cool scene. Mm -hmm. But the whole, you know, I, I don't know, the whole pornograph. We, we see these two guys <laughs> in the bar, these two proles reading out of this book. Mm -hmm. And, oh, this is by, you know, Jason Flinders. And then you go, when they're showing this machine, he goes, yes, this is able to put out yeah. like 300 books a day by J this is the yeah. Jason Flinders machine. <laughs> yeah. Julia is Jason Flinders, essentially. Yeah. yeah or, right. or whatever. Yeah. Pushes the buttons and the, the machine goes with her. That belt is her anti-sex league membership. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, love is a sex crime, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it indicates loyalty to the individual rather mm -hmm. than to the party and Big Brother, mm -hmm. so. right? Or even the potential, the potential for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but seeing so her with her like changed, you know, and looking the way she looks in the dress and everything. I don't know about you guys, but I was I was nervous right there. I'm like, oh no, this is where things are gonna go down. Yeah. Well, there was a sense of foreboding through the whole thing. Like you, you like them. You're like, okay, when's it going to happen? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so they get caught and uh, Peter Cushing, Winston gets sent to reconditioning and you keep hearing about, what is it? Room 101 that everybody's terrified of room 101. Um, so they really, they, I don't know what all they do. What what is it they say to him? He well, says, "How long have I been here?" And I think they say seven weeks, maybe. I think so. But before this, before this, like he had a conversation with her about. I can't. I can't say word for word. But if you guys want to help me out here, when he was talking about um, rats, and mm. oh right, mm -hmm. right. Oh, that was. Mm -hmm. uh what had happened at his home right yeah. yeah when he was a little kid yeah um do you want do you do you want me to tell the story that he said or yeah okay. um well he he was admitting he was had never told anybody before so he was telling julia um because because there was a rat and the and their little love place and um that his he had a little sister who was sick and his mom uh, was working really hard and wasn't at home and um, she like there was a, only a little bit of food and he was supposed to give some some bread to his sister and instead he stole the bread because he was so hungry and he ran outside to eat it and when he came back the rats were eating his sister and so they that's when they introduced the his fear of of rats mm -hmm. Is that what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, they're doing something in the apartment, and all, apparently there's a rat there, and he mm -hmm. just totally freaks out. And mm -hmm. Yeah. So this uh, first he's in this sort of, I don't know, this shaped 
casket mm -hmm. where they're shocking him, I guess. They keep amping it up. And then O'Brien, Andre Morel, mm -hmm. keeps holding up his four fingers. Yeah. Trying to get him to say it's five fingers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, two plus two is four. Two plus two is five. Or so, yeah. yeah. Two plus two is five. How many fingers? Yeah. Which so, reminds me of Star Trek Next Generation because there's an episode. Uh, but okay. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, it even says sometimes four, sometimes five, five sometimes right. three. Depends, right. you know. Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the, you know, he asked him about room 101. So they take him there and it's this box with rats in it um, and a mask that they're going to put over his head and, and uh, let him through. And they don't actually have to do that because that's when he breaks and mm -hmm. says the thing they've been waiting for, which is, do it to her, do it to her, mm -hmm. anything, anything, do it to her mm -hmm. first, you know? Mm -hmm. But what uh, I thought was so powerful about that scene is they don't tell him, they don't say to the audience what they want him to say. No, they um, don't. So you have no idea what the breaking, what the breaking point is, what, what, what really it means when you're, to when you're broken and you see, you really do see five instead of four fingers. And so I wasn't expecting him to do that. And then when he, when he said, no, do that to Julia, like he's, he, I, it was just like, Oh my God, you know, like that was really good at getting the point across that he is, they got him, they broke him. He's, there's nothing for him anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how shame, how much, how that would break your spirit. Um, knowing that you would do something that you never thought that you would do even though you kind of thought maybe you would, <laughs> you know, it's just, I just thought that was such a powerful way to tell that, to, to show how broken he was because he, well, he is, could torture him all, you know, and I don't know. And these shots are where I just, this is where I thought, I just thought this was great. I mean, the makeup is mm -hmm. wonderful, but also yeah. his, his acting is mm -hmm. just stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, He's not dignified. He looks horrible. Yeah. Um, like you said, the makeup he 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 looks pitiful and just disgusting and yeah. broken. Um, mm. mm -hmm. And 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 then O'Brien says to him when he gets him in the mirror, "If you are human, then that is humanity." Mm -hmm. Pointing at the yeah. mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's this is uh, mm -hmm. just that stuff just blew me away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he did such both O'Brien. Uh, Peter Cushing and um, um, Morel, that's that's his name, right? The actor's name. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they were so good. I mean, just even looking at these pictures of Peter Cushing. I mean, he he really he's the guy. He's the man. He's amazing. So then, uh, so this is so later. Uh, now that the I don't know what you want. They don't really call it anything. I don't think I was thinking of it as, you know, reconditioning or something, or, uh, he's walking into this chestnut tree bar and Julia's in there mm -hmm. and she's looking worse for the wear too. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, her voice is very hard now. Mm -hmm. And the minute he says something to her, she doesn't, First thing she says is, I gave you up or something like mm -hmm. that. Right? I be, yeah. Mm -hmm. I betrayed you. I betrayed, I betrayed you. you. Yeah. And he's like, what? I betrayed you too. Mm -hmm. And then she like gets up and leave. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy says, you want me to save a place for you? Nope. Mm -hmm. I know. It was. <laughs> there's just, I don't know how, there's just nothing there. Right. You, right. You, yeah. You look at her eyes and they're just mm -hmm. uh, broken. And then. Mm -hmm. Peter Cushing in that bottom picture was mm -hmm. his sort of state at that time. He was, mm -hmm. he looked better than he did when they were torturing him, but mm -hmm. it, it was just vacant. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just threw that shot in there on the top. That's mm -hmm. when he's sneaking into the parole bar. Mm -hmm. Right. Before he meets Julia, before any of this happens. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, um, <laughs> cause it, it, uh, Andre Morel has a big kind of monologue thing too, where he's mm -hmm. just like saying, 
you know, don't think you're ever going to, you know, the whole point of this seems to me to be, they gave them, they totally manipulated them. They gave them some hope, mm-hmm. almost led them to it. It seems like a little bit mm-hmm. and then pulled it away and said, nah, mm-hmm. there's no hope. Mm-hmm. Right. That's never right. what you're, what you're hoping for is never going to happen. Mm-hmm. 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 And, you know, there aren't that many, I mean, I could talk about this in so many ways, um, if I could find the right words, but, um, oh, what I was going to say was, you know, how often do you see, I mean, we talked about like the seventies, there's always a sad ending or whatever, but I mean, how often do you see where it's like, no, yeah, these people are broken, they're gone, you know, and there's no hope. There's probably going to be no hope. If there is any hope, there's hope years and years and years ahead. People know what they're doing. They know that they're, that they're going to die, but maybe it's going to be for some reason in the future. I mean, it's such a dystopian, horrible mm-hmm. <laughs> ending mm-hmm. and you don't see that very often. So I well, do and appreciate I think those endings too. Was it the, uh, periodically they get these updates from the telescreen and I think one of them, wasn't one of them the Ministry of Plenty? Yeah. Yeah. Telling them yeah. how production was up so many thousand, hundred percent on this and so mm-hmm. much on this. And, and the whole, all through the movie, they're looking for razor blades because nobody right. can get any razor blades. So right. um, mm-hmm. it's sort of an obvious thing that it, things aren't that good. All you have to do is look at, look around at the world that are walking mm-hmm. in. And these are sort of the privileged people, right? Mm-hmm. But they're still walking through a demolished uh, mm-hmm. neighborhoods and mm-hmm. the building they live in is it says there's a sign on it that says victory mansion. I think yeah. I'm like, mm-hmm. Whoa. And it's mm-hmm. just yeah. a couple of, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, the lighting. So I'm just going to, Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's the telescreen mm-hmm. with the evil rebel that, mm-hmm. and this is during the Gold, two minutes. Goldstein, of Goldstein, I think, right. Goldstein. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Probably not um, an accident that it was a Jewish name uh, right after World War II. Uh, this is the two minutes of hate that they all have to have every day. Yeah. Uh, so they all just start screaming at him and hissing and, you know. Uh, but I like the way this was lit, how Winston yeah. Smith was brought out. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that and we see his boss O'Brien right behind him, kind of mm-hmm. you know, keeping tabs on him, and Julia's sitting next to him. And then mm-hmm. uh, similar to that, uh in that same scene, now we see the two of them are looking at each other, and I'm I'm looking at this now and thinking eh, it's probably too artsy fartsy to be thinking this way, but they're they're both like half in shadows and trying to wonder mm-hmm. what the real person is, you know, is mm-hmm. this somebody I can trust or somebody that's, that's going to turn me in or what? Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's morale essentially, uh, or Earl Brian, the character's name, mm-hmm. essentially uh, big brother watching Winston Smith in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Already suspicious, I think, or, or always watching maybe, maybe not suspicious of him, but always watching. Mm-hmm. Not to not to dive away from the the plot of the movie or anything, but I have to mention this guy because he's he's one of my favorites, uh, Wilfred Bramble. So he played both the oh, old no. guy in the bar mm-hmm. that I think was the first one to sing the uh, the song "Oranges and Lemons," say the bells of St. Clemens, <laughs> um, and then was also the guy when uh, they were sitting in there, I don't know what it was, a holding cell or whatever. They kind of bring him in, and then this uh, goon grabs him and drags him out. He plays both those characters. Oh, he does? I didn't yeah. I didn't catch that. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason I bring him up <laughs> is because he played Paul's grandfather in A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Which is one of my favorite movies. And also, mm-hmm. you know, I, 
I'm a Beatles fan, so I'm going to throw it in there. Uh, Good. He was described as a real mixer, you know, a troublemaker. <laughs> but then they always said, oh, I, he's very clean. <laughs> Who's that I little old man? Pictures. Yeah. And then the bottom one is a British show called Steptoe and Son, which uh, Sanford and Son, I think, was derived mm. from that, was, was mm. somewhat based on that. So not having ever seen the show, mm -hmm. I assume it's a man and his son who run a junkyard or... Uh, mm. Interesting. But I think that's uh, the, the British might know him better for that. Uh, so just one of those interesting character actors, I think, that you almost don't recognize from role to role. Mm -hmm. He had a great face. Yeah, the line, the line in The Hard Days and Night is every time somebody sees him, they go, who's that little old man? And Oh, that's Paul's grandfather. <laughs> oh, I, he's very clean. <laughs> he's very clean <laughs> anyway um i just wanted to bring him up and then you know we talked about uh we we didn't talk about we've talked about donald pleasance and uh uh peter cushing endlessly <laughs> but i do know that uh andre morrell was in some pretty sure he was in some hammer stuff now people outside are going you know, the, the hammer fans are going to hammer stuff. Um, <laughs> so he was in Ben Hur, Bridge on the River Kwai. Uh, the thing I was going to bring up was um, the tele, the BBC production of Quatermass in the Pit, mm -hmm. which was late 50s. Well, he was in the camp, the camp on Blood Island, which is Hammer. I remember, yeah. Sorry, Jeff. I I oh, saw that is. stuff too, but I can't remember where it is. Fifty-eight to fifty-nine. Mm -hmm. uh, also in the Giant Behemoth. So a person, uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles. That's that's the other one I was thinking of. He plays Doctor Watson in the Hound of the Baskervilles. So uh, a guy that should be well. Uh, very familiar to genre fans. Cash on demand. Uh, the uh, Peter Cushing, you know, the the Robin the Bank mm -hmm. Hammer film. I don't know if you ever saw that or not. That's pretty good. Yeah, but yeah. He's he's uh, very familiar and very well known. And I was kind of wondering. I mean, this is this is right when Nigel Neal was kind of in his heyday. They have, people just like went for Nigel Neal, you know. Mm -hmm. so, did the Quatermass series and uh, Rudolf Cartier was a very well respected BBC producer director too of the 50s. Uh, and he came from Germany. The UFA studios, remember when we, what were the ones? Uh, I think they did, we talked about them with Faust. Um, but he left Germany, fled the Nazi regime in 1936. And he worked with Neil the previous year on the Quatermass Experiment mm -hmm. serial. So the face of Big Brother was Roy Oxley, a member of the BBC design department. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it was kind of an end joke. Um, all right. There's no point in looking down through this stuff. But uh, any the closing comments, anybody? I know we could talk about this forever, but it's uh, for me, it's it's a... It's a very impressive production in almost all aspects. Uh, I mean, I forgot that it was live, you know, when I was watching it. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it, it did, it, it was impressive. Um, and of course, it makes you uncomfortable because of the, the subjects and what the characters are going through. And then it, you think about what, people around the world are, are facing in their lives um, in certain situations what what you have versus what you don't have and and if, you know love is everything or so you think but then like you see what those two are going through and what they end up doing to each other it, it really makes you think 
about what is it that you value so yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and I I I, it's interesting you said uh, it makes you think because it does definitely make me think and um it stuck with me um since watching it a couple weeks ago for this and then and I also like that you said you're not going to apologize for what you say because um, I feel like in our how things are now and have been for a while, um, you know, it's it's really kind of easy to to poo poo um, or not listen to when people want to talk about these things um, mm-hmm. genuinely and legitimately. Um, and I feel like the stuff in this movie and and I, like I said before, I haven't read the book for a long time, but my understanding was that Neil did a, a pretty close to the book, um, uh, version in the screenplay. Um, but I think he really brings up a lot of really important things. Um, and I love when movies make me think, and I love when sci-fi or genre or whatever horror movies really get down to it and um, show all the cool stuff that they can make you think about. And um, I am so impressed with how uh, it got you to think about the big picture of taking, you know, control over society and, you know, the winners tell the history and all the people who don't have a voice in that Mm -hmm. and how it can beat people down or the system can, can can do that and how it goes from that but also makes it very personal and um really gets to the humanity of a lot of these people and and makes those things really personal and on top of that these actors who i feel like really did an amazing job and really made me think and feel about what it might be like in that position um something that i thought a lot about and was was um kind of struck by was when O'Brien was talking to Julia and um, um, Peter Cushing's character and was trying to get them to say, you know, like, would you do this? Would you do that? And they were like, yes, yes, yes. And, um, and then how he then kind of said, you will be caught, you will be betrayed, you will betray her, you will betray yourself, you will betray me. And it was just this like, given that, this was going to happen and they knew that they were going to do this, that they, they knew that they were going to be broken and that was just part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really struck with that. And then I was also really struck with when they were, when they were talking, when Julia was talking with him about um, Winston, Winston, thank you. Um, And they're saying, Oh, we'll betray each other. We'll, but they'll never know that we love each other or something. I mean, it's like they, they were able to pick like that, that one thing that they would keep for themselves, their, their love for each other, that, that, that couldn't be taken away no matter when they betrayed each other, what they did to each other, what the things they said, um, that was something that they could never get to. And I just, I was just really struck with that. I think that's a, that's reality um, uh, about humanity. And I think it was just good. <laughs> and I know that it's going to be stunt artsy fartsy or whatever, but I don't care. I'm not going to apologize for it. I think these are important things to talk about and they're real things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just looking because I, I swear could be, it was one of these playhouse series, but I know I saw pictures of it. So I know there was a, uh, an American production TV version that starred Edmund O'Brien. Mm. Mm-hmm. Our, what we talked about in the last episode in Fantastic Voyage and another one that had Eddie Albert hmm. um, from uh, that we most people know now from Green Acres um, and then there was the actual there was a major uh, studio film in 1984 that starred John Hurt and John Hurt. Richard mm-hmm. Burton uh, so I'm kind of wanting to go and see those now, though I'm not sure I can take the. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have seen the John Hurt one before, and I remember being, you know, being affected by it. But I don't remember much. I really like John Hurt, so I pretty much will, will watch him in, in anything. But I don't 
like really remember much about it. Yeah. About his performance. Um, well, boy, I think that's it. Any, any other comments anybody wants to make? We, we haven't. <laughs> we, I could talk forever about this yeah, and, and the, the connection between Newspeak, mm -hmm. Ministry of Truth, and fake news and alternative mm -hmm. facts. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's kind of. It was it, really. It, it made me feel really. Um, I don't depressed. You know, like yeah. I don't know, depressed. Depressed, but it was just of like, is this ever going to change? You know, is yeah. anything right. going to change? Because I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about maybe what Orwell was trying to say or whatever, and I was like, I could see people on both sides seeing themselves as the hero or the victim in this story, and what does that say about truth and mm -hmm. like facts <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just, is. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. All right. Well, let's move to, <laughs> we, we do have a bunch of feedback. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to take this, uh, Daphne, uh, first one was some recommendations Mikey Z made a while okay. ago. Hey, Mikey Z. Um, been a while since I offered suggestions, so here they come. Classics. Ghost of Frankenstein, 1942. Werewolf of London, 1935. Dr. X, 1932. And Return of Dr. X, 1939. All fine suggestions. Yes. And I have no doubt we'll get to most of them if we keep going. <laughs> I've thanks, looked at Doctor X a couple times, so thanks, Mikey. Uh, and Whitney, are you up on these? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, we've got one. This was a comment when I put up the uh, schedule for the month. Greg Miller, a listener from Australia, oh. put this in. Okay. Greg Miller says. Very excited to see the Nigel Neal version of 1984 because it made me check if if the years ago promised BFI release had finally come about. It has. Ordered to replace the copy of this, a very murky multi-generation copy with one in which you can actually see what is happening. What is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, this was the Greg was the one that made me go what? And <laughs> <laughs> I jumped yeah. on it, and uh, there's a, there's a uh, I forget the name of it now. I ordered it through Amazon, but it comes from like Rare Waves or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. uh, company. Do you know if there's day. anything else on the on the um, new version? Uh, there is some extras, but I can't remember what they are. Okay. Um, so I'll let you know as soon as I get home, I think it'll be there when I get home. Uh, all right. Uh, so I'll go ahead and take this one. So for, uh, episode 145 Faust, uh, Gregory Crosby, which is another, a, a new commenter that I have a really long comment of, um, that we'll read if we have time. Yeah, uh, it says, yeah, excellent episode. I strongly suggest you see William Dieterle's All That Money Can Buy, 1941, a.k.a. The Devil and Daniel Webster, a brilliant proto-noir that will knock your socks off. And then watch Dieterle's strange and romantic ghost story, Portrait of Jenny, 1948. Highly recommended, though neither are horror, uh, but All That Money Can Buy is close. Hmm. So, of course, <laughs> thank you for that. And we talked about Mr. Dieterle, and I think we mentioned the devil and Daniel Webster. It sounds familiar. And uh, um, cool. so I watched it. I can't uh -huh. remember where I watched it. And it is. It's, it's really good. And the, the, to me, the peak of it is uh, Walter Houston plays Scratch, the, mm. you know, the Mephisto type character. And uh, wow, boy, we lost Whitney. I hope she gets back. Yeah, me too. Um, so anyway, awesome. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. So I watched it, and yeah, uh, Walter Houston is awesome. 
and it is a great morality tale. Okay, I didn't quite get the proto noir though. Hmm. Didn't... Maybe Gregory can. Yeah. Follow yeah. up on that. Um, but I, I would agree with it. It's brilliant. Uh, Daphne, you want to take uh, or Whitney's back here. Hey, Whitney. Uh, Sorry. For a second. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, you see the Scott Wells had one on Faust. Yes. Okay. Scott Wells. He says, Scott Wells. So I'm putting on my historian and folklorist hat here. Believe it or not, Faust was a real person. Johannes Faust was an alchemist, magician, and scholar who lived in the 15th and 16th centuries in Germany. He was often the center of a number of scandals and controversies, and rumor has it, died in an explosion in his alchemy lab. Oh. His <laughs> name became a popular... Rumor has it. <laughs> his name became a popular one to attribute to tales of magic and morality after his death. And even today, there are a number number of grimoires or books of magic that are attributed to him including Praxis Magia Fausti and Black Raven the threefold Corsian Hell. As his folk tales grew so did his legend when Christopher Marlowe wrote his play on Faust in 1589 it's Marlowe's play that both you know I'm sorry I can't I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this right Right, Goth, Goth, Gaunt, Gonode, <laughs> and this film draw from their stories. Great show, guys, and touch on a lot of my favorite things, as you couldn't tell from the rambling, boring history <laughs> lesson. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, that was awesome. I it didn't is. know any of that. That's so great. I'm not going to look to see if I can order those books anyway. <laughs> Oh, you're not? Tap, tap, no, tap, 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 no, tap, I'll tap. never do that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, thanks, Scott. And Scott, Scott's got his own website, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to put the link in uh, the show notes. I, I don't recall it right now, but he does uh, a lot of good horror-related stuff. He was very knowledgeable. So yeah, appreciate bring it. on the history and folklore. Appreciate it, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, then Mikey Z again on uh, Faust. And so there's sort of a pre-Faust and a follow-up one, Daphne, if you want to take both of those. Okay. Hey, Mikey again. Um, Mikey Z, the biblical story of Job might be the inspiration for this tale of manipulation and faith. Never saw this, heard much about Emil Janning's performance and his and the visuals. After seeing the podcast, I will definitely seek this out. You absolutely should, because it's very good. Um. Mikey Z had heard much about this and Emil Janning's performance as Mephisto. Fantastic imagery that definitely inspired the night on Bald Mountain segment of 1941's Fantasia. Special effects are superb, even for now. F.W. F. W. Murnau expertly directs this well-paced fantasy of corruption and faith. Would love to see someone like Robert Eggers take this on as a remake. Great podcast, Grew Crew. Need more silence. Well, he's lucky that a certain Chad isn't here. <laughs> well, Hunch Chad picked Faust, though, right? Uh, yeah, he did. He did. He did. Hunchback so. celebrating a hundredth anniversary this year. Not really horror, but Cheney is fantastic. Yeah, well, I that sounds like a, a really good thing to do sometime mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mikey. So he did go back and see it. All right, uh, for. Let's see, episode 144, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad uh, from Stanley Milton. Speaking of the casting not being Middle Eastern accurate, you <laughs> should review Fifth Voyage of Sinbad 2014, starring and directed by Shaheen Shan Solomon, a Persian-American. It has stop-motion creatures inspired by Ray Harryhausen's Sinbad films. I actually built one of these critters for Sean, a giant crab creature. Wow. Awesome. Cool. I should have to check that out. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not within our purview to uh, to uh, review it because we're doing the classics in the 70s and 80s, but I, I will definitely check that out. Appreciate the information there. That would be and another Mikey Z for the seventh voyage of Sinbad. <laughs> oh, no. This one's 
pretty long. And then Ralph, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to read Mikey Z, just if that's all right with you guys. Um, okay. Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. My favorite Harryhausen. Between the fantastic color cinematography by Wilkie, the fantastic score by Herman, the wonderfully paced direction by Juron, and the exemplary stop motion by the legend. Uh, obviously, Harryhausen. I don't know anyone who isn't a fan of this 50s fantasy epic. From the creature designs, the acting, sets, and costumes, there is much at which to wonder. Torrin Thatcher revels as Sokura. Ker Kerwin Matthews, great as Sinbad. My only issue is the genie portrayed by Richard Iyer. Uh, needed someone like Rex Ingram to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thatcher. Genie versus Sorcerer. There's a film I'd like to see, if only someone like Harryhausen were around today. Great to see Ralph on the panel to provide many insights on the film. Too bad no one mentioned the pop song associated with the film. Sinbad may have been good, but he's may have been bad, but he's good to me. <laughs> hmm. Even back in the 50s, they did whatever it took to sell a film. Fantastic podcast crew. Next one is guaranteed to be classic. Great to see the great Ralph Miller on the panel to discuss my favorite Harry Housen of all time. Um and I think this is like a duplicate stuff here. Uh, love the tete-a-tete tete tete between Chad and Ralph regarding which film was which. <laughs> oh, that's right. Chad watched the wrong movie. <laughs> One thing for certain, Chad is king of taglines. I could go on for days talking about this truly classic 50s tale. Excellent insights by Ralph and the rest of the group crew. As Whitney described it, this is a magical film, as was the podcast classic as always silent up next got to get my reading specs on he's talking about faust mm -hmm. uh so then ralph miller replied to him i don't know whitney had <laughs> sure sure okay eyes and he says michael zacks i appreciate your effuse praise for the film and i'm glad you enjoyed the show there's so much more we could have said about this film but we yammered on for about the length of the movie itself as it was. The song is quite a novelty and you can enjoy it on the 50th anniversary DVD or Blu-ray 2008 that I recommended on the podcast. The music is accompanied by a series of seventh voyage of Sinbad stills. Very cool. I remember ta him talking about that 50th <laughs> anniversary thing. All right, um, I am going to read this other one, that, which is really long uh, from Gregory Crosby, but it's interesting and it touches on all the decades. So we already read it in 80s once, but we're going to do it here in case people don't do both of them. Um, so, and we can stop and talk about them as we go. Dear Guru Crew, first, my sincere thanks. I stumbled upon the decades of horror family during the lost year of the lockdown. <laughs> Amidst my search for a horror movie podcast that didn't inspire me to take an axe to the fiber optic cables of the internet. I dove into the archives, especially with Doc and Santos, and listened to nearly every episode. Sometimes after refreshing my memory with a film found via streaming, sometimes not. I pocketed a few episodes until I could see the film under discussion, especially Bay of Blood, which I finally saw on the big screen this past summer at the Museum of Modern Art's epic two-month-long horror film festival. Ooh. Bravo, as ever, on your discussion of Bava, though I'm still mildly miffed that Bill missed out on the discussion of my all-time favorite Bava, Kill Baby Kill, on Classic Era. Yeah, yeah, we didn't, didn't invite Bill. I actually think Bill was traveling that time. I think I invited him and he it wasn't going to work um during these past two years i've often wondered when i could get around to sending some feedback to express my appreciation for the hours of pleasure decades of war has given me would it be to mount a spirited defense of messiah of evil mm -hmm. sidebar yes it's a hot mess and yet there's something about those pretentious art house 70s horror films that have a disturbing truly nightmarish quality an aura that lingers under the skin long after more accomplished horror films have faded in my mind. Messiah definitely fits that particular category for me. And I, I believe we agreed on that. I mean, holy cow. Uh, there's a lot of really bad films that sometimes leave 
certain scenes are stuck in your mind that keep coming back. Right. All right. Go. I love, um, I love it. I agree hundred percent. Fantastic. That was wonderful. Keep so talking. Then, <laughs> let's see. Besides so fits that thing. Would, would my first missive be an amusing anecdote about how the only monster that truly scared me as a child was the blob because <laughs> I knew my mother would not allow me to sleep with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> would my first email simply be an evil spell that when read aloud by Chad would turn into a severed hand clutching at his throat tagline he's all choked up <laughs> uh, best tagline ever yeah. I think <laughs> <laughs> nothing ever felt quite right for my first foray into contact I agree with about the blob and I remember Santos talking about that was his uh like scariest monster movie because it was, it was unthinking. You know, what were you going to do? What could you do? There was no, no fighting it. Um, then one recent night searching for the comfort food of a creature feature, I found an excellent quality upload of the deadly spawn on YouTube. As I watched the film, a curious thing began to happen. I could hear Bill's voice in the back of my mind describing the practical effects. I could hear Chad singling out his favorite scene. I could hear Crystal enthusing about the gore. I could hear Jeff <laughs> describing one of the cast's obscure TV credits. <laughs> I never do that. Uh, in short, I found myself listening to a Decades of Horror podcast that did not yet exist. It seems I cannot watch an old horror movie now without the voices of the Gru crew lurking in the shadows. Not that I'm complaining, mind you, but this is still an uncanny development. <laughs> then I thought, aha, here's a reason to write, to request the Deadly Spawn be added to the list of upcoming shows. And then, a week later, you announced that Deadly Spawn was the next episode. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> Anyway, uh, kudos on that excellent episode. I was especially amused to find out the killing of the heroine wasn't an inspired horror decision, but merely an actor's sudden unavailability during the shoot. You will be pleased and or alarmed to hear that many of the comments made matched up with the ones I heard in my mind. <laughs> I'm not sure what this means, except that I've likely listened to too many DOH episodes. Continue the excellent work from the classics to the 70s to the 80s, I know you base your selections on what's streaming, but here's a few suggestions. For classic era, Fiend Without a Face, um, Stop Motion and Fun, and The Flesh Eaters, vivid childhood memories of one very disturbing scene. For 70s, Bad Ronald, a TV film, also a haunting childhood memory. And for 80s, The Hidden, a movie I dug so much I saw it twice in the theater, but whatever comes down the pike, I'm sure... Uh, I'll enjoy everyone's impressions as always. I know this is a long email, so I suggest you wait to read it when you need to fill in time after one of those truly terrible films where there's nothing much to say, like The Ripper or The Howling 2. <laughs> P.S. I identified my favorite Baba above as Kill Baby Kill, but I must confess, that's my favorite gothic Baba. My little black Baba heart truly belongs to Planet of the Vampires. Yay. All right. Uh, cheers, Gregory Crosby. So, thank you. Uh, and he describes himself as a poet, freelance writer, and editor uh, in New York. So, um, I hope we hear more from him. Yes. And uh, as we said in the 80s when we read this, you can make short comments. <laughs> I suspect you're somebody that enjoys the uh, act of writing, though. So, uh, whatever you feel I'm doing. Um, Right, People. love the comments too. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So here we are again. Let's see. I now need to find. Ah. That's it for this episode. But every two weeks, we'll be focusing on a specific film release between 1920 and 1969. Next up is one chosen by Whitney. What, what is it, Whitney? Hasta el viento tiene miedo. Which is even the wind is afraid. By, From 1968. Yes, directed by Carlos Enrique da Boada. Yeah, yeah. Which did the Book of Stone that we did? I don't know. Yes. Was that about a year ago? Um, I think so. And also starring Margot Lopez, who was also in that movie. Yes. So. 
if I remember right, this was one of his that was highly, uh, highly, uh, yeah, yeah. It was like when they talked about his best films, this was one mm -hmm. of them. So I'm interested. Yay. Uh, so check that out. I think it's available on YouTube, correct? Yes. Right now. Cool. Uh, plenty of ways to stay in touch. So please send your feedback to feedback at gruesomemagazine.com or you can leave comments on the YouTube channel. Uh, Gruesome Magazine's H&R and DOH podcast Facebook group or at the website at gruesomemagazine.com. We love comments. We love our listeners. They are far smarter than us. So they, at least speaking for my own self. Uh, yeah, me too. They give us. <laughs> they add for a, myself. <laughs> they, they add a lot to the shows. I, I, Absolutely. And uh, thank you so much to the uh, classic era women whose names end in. Uh, I'm happy. It was. I was enjoyed having you here. So so sorry, Chad couldn't be here. Yeah. Um, but anyway, catch us again here in two weeks. For another great horror movie of the classic era is only decades of horror can do it. Say good night. Good night. <laughs>